In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, today we celebrate Trinity Sunday. Now, how many people know about the Trinity? Right? Do you know about it, though? Do you know? Do you understand it? Right? How many people understand and can explain the Trinity without being a heretic? <laughs> now, I didn't see any hands go up there. Right, that's because, you know, it's kind of sad. On Trinity Sunday, so many preachers, you know, it used to be the joke. If you were the one who came out of seminary or either one in seminary, they'd make you preach on Trinity Sunday. I've been guilty of that at different points. And then I kind of had a come to Jesus moment or come to Trinity moment, maybe we'd call it, where I realized that to shy away from talking about the Trinity, despite these very exciting readings, is to miss a huge opportunity into who we are as Christians. Because everything stems from the Trinity. The whole foundation of our being is understood inside the Godhead that we subscribe to the word Trinity. So you see, for preachers to shy away from that and talk about the wonderful uh, reading of Nicodemus, which I just for the record will say, and I'll just leave you with this cliffhanger, and maybe we'll pick it up in the clergy forum. Nicodemus is a good Episcopalian. This is this is good Episcopalian stuff right here in this little reading. So come to the clergy forum and I'll defend myself on that. But let's talk about the Trinity. Let's talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the Trinity was not a doctrine that just came about at some point in the very beginning. It wasn't like the early Christian writers and the early church fathers were talking about the Trinity as if it was something that was just understood. You see, they weren't. The first person to coin the Greek word Trinitas is Tertullian in the second century, third century, around 200. Again, the way he uses it, the way he talks about it is not to take away from the mystery of the Trinity. You see, the Trinity existed before Jesus. That might be not seem so crazy. If you go back to the beginning in Genesis, God the Father spoke. The spirit moved, and the gospel of John tells us that the Logos, the word of God, the son of God, was present. So there in perfect harmony, the Trinity creates the world, creates you and me. All throughout the Old Testament, we hear about the spirit being des descending upon the prophets. We hear about the word of God coming down to Samuel, to King David, to also the prophets, and yet here we are with this perfect dance of the Trinity all throughout the Old Testament. You see, there as the foundation of it all is God. Is God. We fast forward to the incarnation and yet there in perfect harmony, yet again, the Trinity moves. God, the Father speaks, the Spirit descends upon Mary and the Logos is born in human form in the flesh. At the, resur at the crucifixion, there again, the spirit descend ascends and God speaks and the Logos speaks and yet in perfect harmony. In perfect harmony, the Trinity moves. Now the trouble we run into when we talk about the Trinity is when, as I joked about it a minute ago, is we call it a heresy. Because, or we, we call ourselves heretics because a lot of times when we start talking about the Trinity, we try to demystify the mystery that is God. We try to make God fit into some kind of a box that is comfortable to us. And when we do that, we lose, it loses its significance, it loses its power, and it loses its mystery. One of the great, one of the great heresies that we still talk about today is the three in one, one in three. That is the heresy of known as modalism. To help you understand that a little bit more, understand me as a priest. So here, right now, I'm functioning as a priest. I'm attempting to explain the unexplainable. When I go home, I'll be a dad, because more than likely, given how Linux woke up this morning, dad's gonna have to step in and relieve mama from some of his behavior this morning. And then later in the day and throughout the day, I will be a husband to my wife, Vanessa. Three different modes of the same person. That is not the Trinity. 
The Trinity is perfect in all three. God doesn't just switch modes. That would take away from the Godhead, from that perfect harmony, that unity of beings working in tandem with one another. Now later, another heresy that comes along that we're kind of famous for is talking about, so Arius, this is Arius, this comes out early in the first couple hundred years of Christianity. He says, no, that's crazy. God is not three different modes. He's not three different identities all wound up in one. He just turns on an identity. That's not it. I got that. He says, here's what it is. You have God the Father and you have two lesser beings. Right? What's wrong with that? Two lesser beings. Well, then Arius kicks up. And of course, Arius is more famous for the one who argued about the two natures of Jesus. He could not rationalize in his mind that Jesus could be both fully human and fully divine, that somehow God would die on a cross. In Arius' mind, the divinity of the person of Jesus left earth before Jesus was crucified. That's what he's most famous for, but this is his other little heresy that he had going. God is not one greater being and two lesser beings. That's almost weird. It is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as Paul tells us. Now, to quit talking about doctrine, what does that mean for us? Everything. Everything. And the one thing I want us to connect to today, if we think about nothing else, if you're just sitting there going, what the heck is he talking about? The one thing I want you to, to really hold on to is this reality, that in the incarnation, God became man. The Son of God took on flesh, just like you and me. In every way that we are, he was human. He was human. He walked this earth, he taught, and then he was crucified. There were nails that were entered into his hands and his feet. There was a spear that pierced his side. And that wounded body was buried. And for three days, it laid entombed. And on the third day, as we celebrate on Easter, it rose. That very body, and remember the story of Thomas who said, I will not believe that you've seen Jesus unless I can put my hand in the marks in his hand and my hand in his side. And the Son of God does that for Thomas, and he does it for us through Thomas. And then you fast forward 10 days before Pentecost, the ascension, and that body ascends back into the Godhead. The Son of God ascends to be with to be with the Father, but not a perfect body. A wounded human body now sits in the Godhead. The one who we profess in our creed is going to come back and judge us is one who looks just like us. One who knows what we know. The Son of God. The Logos. The Word. The Word of God. And all its woundedness sits inside the Trinity. And that makes us different in so many ways than any other religion that a human body is now in the Trinity, in the Godhead. God loves us so much, so much that God became man and suffered for us. And then that is assumed back up into the Godhead. There's power in that. So when we hear these stories like Nicodemus, when we hear these stories from Paul, we must remember that underneath it all is a God who loves us dearly, a God since the beginning of time has been moving in tandem with humanity, constantly calling us home through the spirit, through the word, through the creator. God has been moving. And we remember that story of the potter in the Old Testament. God is the potter, the one forming the clay. That every day God is leaning down on you and trying to form you into the perfect creation that he made, calling you home, calling you to the life that God calls you to do, which is bigger than yourself, moving you outside of yourself to do great and wonderful things for the sake of the gospel. I think all too often, sometimes we approach our faith in our church, and, and I think there's a lot of people out there struggling right now who see church and they wonder in terms of, what's my return on investment? What's my return on investment of attending a church? 
And we can laugh at them and we can criticize them, but we've created this environment. We've lost the mystery. We've lost the moving beyond ourselves to some degree. What, think about the things that we question. Think about if you could walk a day in my shoes, and I'm not, I'm at St. Luke's. Let me do it this way. If you could walk a day in my shoes three years ago at Christ Church and Temple, if you could only hear the questions that I get asked, which to people are very important questions, but are they moving people towards the gospel? Are they moving people towards salvation? Are they moving people into the mystery of the Trinity? This is the reality of our faith. We have to really be honest with ourselves about who we are and what we're called to do and what we're called to do as Christians. Some of the things I think we spend a lot of time worrying about are not worth it. They're just not worth it in this world right now where people are hurting People are sad. People have lost touch with God. And they're looking for people to show them who God is, who the Trinity is. Who is that? They're not looking for doctrine, not looking for what I just did. They're looking for relationship. They're looking for you, you as a chosen child of God, to be honest about who you are. Next week, you're gonna, we're going to celebrate seniors, and I'm not going to spoil this. But I am going to tell you, if, if you were thinking about missing church, don't do it. There's a senior who's going to stand up here and say some very powerful words about their experience here at St. Luke's. If there's a dry eye in this room when she gets done, I'll be shocked. And I think that story she's going to share, and I know I can't tell you now, so you have to trust me, is an example of what it means to be a Christian and what St. Luke's has done so powerfully for so many young people in this church. So when we celebrate Trinity Sunday, let us remember the foundation of it all, where it all begins. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We say it at baptism, we were reminded of it at confirmation last week, and we're gonna be reminded of it embodied in one of your own youth next week. And every Sunday and every day after that, the Trinity is moving in perfect harmony in our lives, creating, calling, sanctifying. This is the Trinity. This is God. This is the God who loves all of us and the God who calls us to love, calls us to that discipline, calls us outside of ourselves to the bigger world in which we are a part. So let's seize that moment and let's live as Trinitarian people, people of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.